Hello, everyone. Back again for Chapter 10 of this GOB or uh, Chem 51 course. Today's topics are looking at assets and bases. Specifically, we'll look at the Arrhenius acid and base definition, the Brenstead-Lowry, I'll just say Brenstead because it's easier, Brenstead-Lowry acid base definition. Uh, we'll talk about water specifically. It's a very interesting uh, amphoteric type compound. We'll see what that means. We'll talk about the strength of acids and bases and how we measure it. And then finally, we will look at buffers very briefly. So without further ado, let's go. Okay, so in general, as we start to look at acids and bases uh, in our homes, we know that pretty much anything we use to clean our homes with is a base. So here we've got an image of Drano, we've got some ammonia, we have some baking soda, some oven cleaner. Typically things that we, things that degrease, like grease fighting chemicals, they're gonna be bases. Typically things that we eat, whether they be um, here, we've got uh, some vitamin C by the look of it, some lemon juice, coffee, tea, pizza, cereal, anything like that is gonna be slightly acidic. So we eat and drink acids, we clean our homes, we fight greasy, greasy buildups with bases. So that's how you can find these materials in your home. The Arrhenius definition comes from the Swedish scientist Svante Arrhenius. And essentially, uh, an Arrhenius acid is a compound that generates uh, hydronium ions in solution. Uh, so either the proton H plus or the hydronium ion H3O plus, anything that generates that in, in solution would be an Arrhenius acid. An Arrhenius base is anything that generates hydroxide ions in solution. Uh, and there's a pretty annoying dog that's now going to bark for the next remainder of this video. So thanks, dog. Um, okay, so an Arrhenius acid, Arrhenius base. Notice, although it's not obvious here, acids and bases are chemical opposites of each other. So chemically, the opposite of a hydronium ion or a proton is a hydroxide ion. Um, you'll see in short order that they are chemical opposites of each other. We've got a list of some acids here. Uh, there's a, a sequence of binary acids where the acid is composed of just two elements, like a binary mixture. And typically for acids, the first element is always a hydrogen because it has to produce the proton. The proton when mixed with water generates a hydronium ion. So H2O plus H plus makes H3O plus. That's the hydronium ion. So we inherently need this H in our acid to generate hydronium. Binary acids usually have the prefix hydro and then the part of the non-metal comes next with the suffix ic acid. So hydrochloric acid is HCl, hydrobromic acid is HBr, hydroiodic acid is HI, hydrosulfuric acid is H2S. Then we have other acids which have an oxygen in, and these are called oxyacids, and their names are different. They are named just after the anion. So here, for example, in nitric acid, the anion is nitrate, NO3 minus. So we take the prefix of the word nitrate, nitr, and then we just end it with ic acid. Nitrite is nitrous acid. Uh, we've got sulfuric acid because of sulfate. Sulfite becomes sulfurous acid, etc., uh, etc. Et so in short, we can have binary acids and oxy acids. Um, here's some examples of bases. Now, bases generate, uh, at least Arrhenius bases generate hydroxide ions in solution. So they must have an anion that's hydroxide. So here, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, they all contain hydroxide. And then someone goes and throws in ammonia. Is ammonia an Arrhenius base? Yes, 
we don't have to contain OH minus, we just have to generate it in solution. So ammonia, if you put it in solution, will generate hydronia, uh, will generate hydroxide. Um, although it's not explicitly shown here, if you take NH3, add water to it, uh, you'll see, and we might have it on another slide, and certainly my students will have it in their homework, it will generate hydroxide, so it's an arena space. So you can either contain OH minus yourself, or you can generate it from water uh, when you're added to it, and therefore you are an arena space. In general, acids and bases react in a neutralization reaction, which is a specific type of double displacement reaction to form a salt and water. So, so far we, we have three types of ionic compound. An acid is an ionic compound, a base is an ionic compound, a salt is also an ionic compound. Um, so here's some examples of acid-base neutralization reactions. Here, the acid is written first, the base is written second, Thus, obviously, water is written last, um, and then uh, the salt is written here. Now, in this example, uh, you might say, okay, well, fluoride's not a salt, it's an iron. Um, yes, what's missing here would be a counter iron, right? So I've got a negative charge here and a positive charge. You could combine these together to form uh, an ionic compound if you like. Um, uh, another reason why this looks a bit funny is we've not taken a base, we've taken water that's acting like a base, uh, but it's, it's a lot more simple when you take a base that's not water, uh, and then you can genuinely see the ionic compound, uh, the salt ionic compound. Okay. In the Brenstead Lowry definition of acids and bases, we have a slightly different definition. A Brenstead Lowry acid is a proton donor, where here a proton is H, and a Brenstead Lowry base is a proton acceptor. Here it's more obvious to see that acids and bases are opposites because we're talking about one object, a proton, and you either donate them away or you accept them back. So that opposite donation versus acceptance directly reminds us that that chemically opposite. Let's look at this example um, of, uh, we'll inspect this equation as um, from the brenstead lowry definition. So here you can see why ammonia from the previous slide would qualify as an Arrhenius, uh, an Arrhenius base because it generates OH minus. Okay, so now back to brenstead lowry definition. Aristotle said you are you what you repeatedly do so nitrogen in ammonia on the left of this expression here has three hydrogen. Moving to the right, it now has picked up a fourth hydrogen and a plus charge. It's accepted a proton. So nitrogen on the left accepted a proton to become nitrogen on the right. Therefore, nitrogen on the left is a proton acceptor. It's a branch that Lowry base. If we go back again, nitrogen on the right has four protons. As it becomes nitrogen on the left, it's donated a proton, and now it only has three. So this red nitrogen on the right is a branched Lowry acid. It's a proton donor. So notice that bases become acids and acids become bases. So if you're a, a reactant base, your product on the right will be an acid and vice versa. Water over here, oxygen has two protons. If we go over to the right, oxygen now has one proton. We've lost an H plus. An H plus. That explains why we've exposed the negative charge and we've lost an H because we've lost an H plus. So water on the right or the oxygen on the right is a proton donor, so it's an acid and acids produce bases. Conversely, if we read right to left, bases produce acids. This idea of a reactant becoming a product is a pair of chemicals. We call these conjugate pairs. Conjugate just means joined together. We've joined a reactant and a product together. 
by definition, conjugate pairs differ by only one proton, plus or minus a proton. Um, so this is the way that we scrutinize and inspect branched dead Lowry acids and bases. Um, and I just want, I just recopied again the Arrhenius definition just to compare on one slide the branched dead Lowry definition versus the Arrhenius definition. For the most part in GOB, we'll be interested in the branched dead Lowry definition. Okay, water is amphoteric. What does that mean? Well, the prefix ampho reminds us, or a, well, where another place we've seen the prefix amph is in amphibian. We know that an amphibian is, for example, a frog can exist uh, on land and in water. That means it has like a dual description. So this dual nature of an amphoteric material, here the dual means acid and base. So water can be acidic and basic depending on its environment. So amphoteric in general here means both acid and base. Um, if you are a protic material and amphoteric, so here protic means if you contain protons, if you can both accept and donate a proton, specifically your amphiprotic. So amphoteric is much more general. Within that, you can be amphipro amphiprotic. There are other types of amphoteric materials that are aprotic that we're not interested in in GOB. But if you see amph amphoteric or amphiprotic uh, in the same context, one is just a more specific version of the other, but both can be used for water. So um, we saw in the previous slide that water was behaving as an acid. Now water is behaving as a base. So here oxygen has two protons, but now oxygen has three protons. So oxygen here in water is accepting a proton. It's acting like a base. So it can be an acid and a base depending on its environment. In this molecule, um, it's acting as an acid. So oxygen has two protons. Oxygen, its conjugate partner on the product side, oxygen has one proton. So with respect to the left, oxygen was acting as an acid. So again, here it's a base, here it's an acid, it's amphiprotic. Uh, if you, even amongst its own kind, water, when it mixes with itself, one member can form uh, can act like an acid, one water can act like a base. And this is why water is actually neutral overall, because it's 50% acidic and 50% basic. So it's exactly neutral. And we use this dual nature of water, this amphiprotic nature of water, to define a pH scale, with neutral being the exact midpoint of the pH scale. Um, Another piece of vocab here, water can auto-ionize. That means it can become an ionic compound by itself, but it does it to such a small degree. Overwhelmingly, we describe water as a covalent compound. So if we take a beaker of water like this, we can see all the water molecules in it. We know that water is amphoteric or specifically amphiprotic. So one of these waters here labeled red is gonna act like an acid and it's going to donate a proton to the base. So if we take one of these red protons, stick it on the blue structure, we get the hydronium ion, which is our acid. The acid originally that had the two H's has now lost one of its H's, it donated it away. It's only got one left, so by definition it's a hydroxide and is therefore basic. So again, acids become bases, bases become acids. So you can link the two red structures on either side of the arrows as a conjugate pair. They differ by one proton. You can lump together the two blue structures. They differ by one proton. You can label them as a conjugate pair. We have this idea of uh, equilibrium constant. So K is constant. Water, W means water. We have this expression for the equilibrium constant of water. It's also known as the auto-ionization constant because water ionizes automatically. 
So you basically look at the ratio of your products, ionic products, uh, we, to the ratio of your reactants. Now, there's a rule that we definitely won't go into that much in, in, gen, in GOB that says that when you look at equilibrium constants, you only look at liquids, sorry, you only look at gases and aqueous substances. You completely ignore liquids, you completely ignore solids. So aqueous means dissolved in water. So the hydronium ion and hydroxide ion are dissolved in water, so we look at them. That's why they feature in our equilibrium expression. Um, liquid water on the left here is a liquid. By definition, we just ignore them. So we don't have a denominator here. We just have a numerator. So we have the product of our, uh, our produced ions. If we take uh, the square bracket here, square bracket just means concentration. The concentration of our hydronium and hydroxide ions multiplied together equal 10 to the negative 14. So as you can see, we have very little ionic material. Uh, how much covalent material do we have? The inverse of 10 to the negative 14. So if you take the number one, divide it by 10 to the negative 14, you essentially get a massive number. And that represents the weighted average of all the covalent constituents. So water is covalent. Uh, the strengths of acids and bases. Um, essentially, if you want to look at acids and bases, let's see if I have it on the other slide. Yes, I do. Okay, a strong acid, strong just means completely dissociates. So if you have 100% ionic dissociation to give free ions, that's a strong acid. Likewise, a strong base completely dissociates. Weak acids and bases partially dissociate, so anything less than 100%. Um, and we can measure strength and weaknesses or, you know, strong or weakness, strong or weak on the strength scale by looking at either the equilibrium constant K or a pH scale, which applies specifically to water. So here, if we look at, um, here we have the K scale. So we've already seen KW, which applies only to water. If we in general look at the KA scale, this applies to an acid. Similarly, we would have the KB scale that applies to base. But you'll get the idea when we look at KA. We can have K values uh, greater than or less than one. A strong acid has a, a K value greater than one. So we can see here that hydroiodic acid has a value of around 10 to the 9, which is clearly greater than 1, so that would be a strong acid. Whereas uh, acetic acid or vinegar has a value of around 10 to the negative 5, which is clearly less than 1. So acetic acid is a weak acid, whereas hydroiodic acid is a strong acid. Um, not shown here, but likewise, a strong base would have a KB value greater than one. A weak base would have a KB value less than one. How that applies to our dissociation. Um, if you look at this equilibrium, uh, this back and forth between products and reactants, if you're a strong material acid or base, you basically are described by your free ions. You essentially have negligible reactant. Um, so you are large because when we take the ratio of your products divided by your reactant concentration, because your reactant concentration essentially doesn't exist, you're essentially all product. You have a high numerator. Conversely, if you're weak, you essentially have a low concentration of product, which is the numerator in our equilibrium expression. So you essentially have no, uh, a negligible numerator and a very large denominator. So you're a bottom heavy fraction. So you're less than one. So specifically look at the pH scale. It's much more specific. It only applies to water. And the P here just stands for negative base 10 logarithm. So it's a logarithmic power scale. And H stands for hydronium or the proton. 
So um, in essentially a pH value equal to seven is neutral. A pH value greater than seven is basic. A pH value less than seven is acidic. Here we can see the pH values of some common materials. Um, pure water is neutral. Uh, blood is slightly basic, but pretty much neutral. Uh, bleach is very basic. We mentioned at the start of this video that most cleaning materials are basic. They cut grease and they have to be basic to do that. But things that you consume like beverages, uh, we don't have any food here, but definitely things that you would consider food items uh, would be acidic. Um, and that generally seems to be the divide. Again, my students will see calculations in homework. Uh, I'm not going to make this video three hours long by putting those calculations in here. But there will be extra videos on my playlist about those calculations. Okay, and the last slide to keep this as short as humanly possible is looking at buffers. Buffers resist pH change. Um, sorry, I lost my annotation bubble. So buffers resist pH change. Buffers typically are composed of a weak acid and its conjugate base, or a weak base and its conjugate acid. Other than mention what they are and tentatively how they work, we don't really discuss buffers that thoroughly in this course. It would be discovered, discussed much more thoroughly in a general chemistry course. We just want to roughly know what they are. So it's something as a weak acid or base system that resists pH change. Um, as you can see here, they resist a, an insult under acidic or basic conditions. Um, they work via Le Chatelier's principle, which um, I don't recall discussing. I think, hmm, do I discuss Le Chatelier's principle on another video? I definitely have a video on that. I'll just make that, let's just say for the argument, because I don't have it right here. I'll include the Le Chatelier video somewhere else. But essentially, if you have an unbuffered system and you, let's go back here. If I have, um, let's say I have uh, an unbuffered system and I dump a lot of acid in, I'm going to make that acidic. If I have an unbuffered system I, and I dump base in, I'm going to make it basic. If I have a buffered system and I dump acid in, I'm going to neutralize the acid with base and essentially undo the effect of adding acid. I'm going to neutralize the acid in a way. If I add base, I'm going to neutralize the base. So um, again, I'll, I'll leave the comment on Le Chatelier's principle to a Le Chatelier video. But essentially for now, for this video, a buffer resists whatever the insult is trying to do. Uh, if you look at this cartoon over here, uh, if you add an acid to water without a buffer, you acidify it, you reduce the pH. Uh, dramatically. If you add acid to a water that's buffered, it might lower the pH, but it resists heavily and you get within the same range that it was initially. Likewise, if you add the base to water without a buffer, you rapidly increase the pH. You might increase the pH slightly if it's buffered, but you certainly keep it within the same range. It becomes important in GOB to discuss buffers because biological systems are all heavily buffered. Can you imagine eating all the foods that you put in your body? If they were to alter your the pH of your blood, you would die. So your body has to rapidly and aggressively buffer anything you eat or drink. Um, that leads us on to uh, your thoughts on alkaline water. My students will have an assignment to do on the pros and cons or the legitimacy of alkaline water. So I don't want to weigh on too heavily here for the benefit of that assignment, but I challenge you to think whether alkaline water is really uh, a thing. Is it, you can make it alkaline. What happens when you drink alkaline water? Uh, is there any way that it's going to change the pH of your blood? I'll leave you with that 
and I look forward to reading your comments in the assignment. And that will conclude this video.